The other problem with the ride is that there were a lot of things they hyped up about the ride, especially in the format of calling it a straddle coaster. (sighs) It's not what I would refer to as a straddle coaster. The ride vehicle is supposed to look like a snowmobile or like a jet ski, basically. I thought that you would be actually straddling a seat like you would a jet ski (laughs) or a snowmobile. But instead, you're basically sitting on a chair (laughs) with your legs slightly to the side. (laughs) That is Mary Kwiatkowski, who is back to talk about the latest roller coaster added to Busch Gardens Williamsburg, the Dar Coaster. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Hey there, thanks for joining me here on episode 211 of the Tomorrow Society podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton. Excited to talk more about Busch Gardens Williamsburg with Mary Kwiatkowski. She's been on in the past talking about the history of the park. Pantheon, the coaster that came before this one, the Dar Coaster. But we're going to talk about a lot more than just the new edition, which occupies the place formerly that held the Curse of Dark Castle, a very cool motion simulator, kind of on par with Spider-Man or Transformers. So we're going to dive into the history of that. Then Mary will give her review of the Dark Coaster, and we'll talk about some recent updates that are coming to the Loch Ness Monster Coaster at one of the coolest regional parks you can find anywhere. So let's get right to it. Here is Mary Kwiatkowski. <laughs> So, Mary, we are here to talk about what's new at Busch Gardens Williamsburg, including the Dar Coaster. But before we even do that, I've got to ask you about something else, because, you know, I saw on Instagram that you participated in what looked like a really cool event called Can You Survive the Great Mountain? For charity, it relates a lot. You and I both are fans of Survivor. Looks like you sort of played a little Survivor. So I have to know something about this before we even go any further. Yes, I participated in Can You Survive the Great Mountain back in July of 2023. It was an amazing experience hosted by Brandon Clark, who uh, used to do Can You Survive online and has in the last couple of years transferred it to this really great live reality game uh, based in Maine. It was an amazing experience. You participate for charity and how far you get in the game depends on how much money you're going to be able to donate to your charity. If anyone out there ever wants to play Survivor but can't get on the show or doesn't want to do it on the show, I highly recommend going on something like Can You Survive? It was a really fantastic experience. I have a few questions. I don't want to get us too far down this road because I could just spend an hour asking about this. So I saw it was like four days, the total Mm -hmm. thing, but do you sleep like in the wild? Do you get food? Like how, how much is that element? And it looks like you do challenges. How much does it relate to Survivor? Yeah, our season was particularly physical because we had to start the thing with a like eight mile hike up a mountain. So we were all given one granola bar at the very start of the game. Some people ate it instantly, not realizing that would be (laughs) their food. (laughs) I saved mine and ate it over the course of a couple of days. And uh, all the tribes were given, I think I calculated the equivalent of basically like a quarter of a cup of rice per person. My tribe elected to eat their entire thing of rice (laughs) the first evening. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Some people (laughs) rationed it. Uh, And if you made it far enough into the game, you might make it to different uh, rewards. Or I think they actually did right after I got voted out, they did a uh, auction challenge. So there was other food. But yeah, pretty much we're sleeping outside. We're building fire. I, I had to ask. I kept asking everyone. I was like, wait, we're allowed to just go like pick up <laughs> like branches from the trees and put them put them in this fire pit and make fire but yes yeah it was it was great it was very real and you know even in only 4 days you're going to get hungry and you're going to get tired 
Yeah. So how did you end up doing? You said you got voted out. How did it end I up did. going? I got I got a screwed over by the the old mergatory twist. <laughs> so I uh, made it right to the middle of the game numerically. I think I came in. I don't at 13th place, 12th place, something like that out of the 21 of us that were in the game, but I made it three out of four days into the game. So it was nice. They, they just really, that last day is a vote, 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 vote. So wow. yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. They did a really good job recreating a lot of the classic iconic survivor challenges. You know, we had blindfold puzzles. We had, um, a, a version, I would say of, uh, some motion, Probably my favorite challenge I got to participate in where you have to balance and stack blocks navigating forward and backward while balancing a rope. If you've seen Survivor, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about, but it was very uh, it was very fun to be able to do some of these classic challenges. Yeah. Oh, man, I would be so bad at that balance one where you, like what they would have, like sometimes they make them spell immunity or different yes, things. And, oh, one. my gosh, I would just they would just be like, Dan has sat on the course and is giving up because he can't even get one block. Like the Jeff equivalent would be very mad yes. at me for sitting on the course. <laughs> um, OK, well, speaking of other things that are fun. There's Bush Gardens Williamsburg. Wow, that is a great segue. But we are here today. If other, if you have not been listening for a long time, Mary has come on twice before on this show. The first time we talked a lot about just Bush Gardens Williamsburg and the history and a lot of the cool rides. And then last year, Mary came on and talked about Pantheon, which is their, was their big coaster, which took a while, but finally, you know, launched, goes forward and backwards. Very cool coaster. This time we are going to talk about Dark Coaster, sometimes known as Dark Coaster Escape the Storm which is a launched indoor family coaster from Intamin, which is the first indoor straddle coaster. All these things sound just incredible. You know, I've heard mixed things. We'll get, we're going to dig into that in a minute. But, you know, what I would like to do first, Mary, is Dark Coaster sounds like a weird name on its own, but that is, of course, an homage to Curse of Dark Castle, which was a dark ride that was there for a long time, closed in 2017, but had motion simulation, physical sets, special effects. It kind of reminds me from what I've seen online of like Spider-Man or Transformers Universal, though maybe not on the same scale, but something similar. But I would love up front, if people don't know much about Curse of Dark Castle, Mary, how would you describe kind of what it was and um, why people still think about it? Yeah, so Curse of Dark Castle was really a phenomenon when it came out. Uh, what made it so impactful and interesting was, like you said, at this point in time, you know, in the in the late 1990s, early 2000s, this idea of a 3D motion simulated kind of ride that was part roller coaster, part dark ride, uh, part 3D video was really unheard of. And so the the first one to be made of its kind was the Amazing Spider-Man ride in Universal Studios. And I believe that one came out in 1999 and it it was a it was a dark ride, but when you think of dark rides up to that point, you pretty much had a lot of the Disney like the Peter Pan ride or other ones where you you're in a little contraption moving along uh physical sets and that was pretty much it. At, at this point, vehicles didn't have the ability to have pitch, roll, heave, yaw, the, the motions in the vehicle themselves. And then the real thing that the amazing uh, Adventures of Spider-Man ride added was this 3D uh, technology so that you would have 3D videos that you'd come across wearing your 3D glasses. And this is uh, a technology that was called... I think it's called like splinching. No, it's not that. <laughs> it's like <something>, squinching. <laughs> squinching is the technology. Um, so the idea there is that if you think about it, um, when you're riding these rides, you can't necessarily see it. But now rides have this all the time. You think of like Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. Um, but back in the 1990s, there was never a ride technology to be designed where um, 3D video could be seen from a moving point of view. So 
guests moving alongside a screen were meant to think that the screen was just an extension of the real world. So they need the perspective in the screen to shift as the writers moved. So the result would be basically you'd stand in front of the screen on a ride. The images in the screen would appear to squish or stretch or slide. However, from the ride perspective, uh, using calculated point of view motions, the video itself would appear to be just part of their surrounding. So that was kind of really new at the time. And uh, you, you think of this as being like, I mentioned Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. It's that combination of physical elements of the dark ride mixed in with, you know, you're going along a track, you might see some physical things, and then you stop in front of a screen or move in front of a, a moving screen uh, when video is happening. So that was really what was so impressive about this type of ride. And then more importantly, what was so impressive about Dark Castle was that this ride at, up to this point had only been created at Universal Studios in a massively big theme park that's a you know year-round park. So no one ever thought that uh, Busch Gardens or another regional seasonal theme park would be able to capitalize on this type of technology. Yeah, well, that's the thing because I think Spider-Man is still amazing and Transformers does a good job. But the one I thought of the most when I was like, I've watched ride videos and all this is Forbidden Journey. And not that Dark Castle does not have at least giant dragons that are physical or Dementors or things like that. But going, you kind of feel like in a way with Dark Castle, like you're flying a little bit or you're floating through this castle and things are interacting with you, especially Forbidden Journey's like Quidditch scenes and stuff. It mm -hmm. felt really familiar. But again, like you said, it's so much earlier. And also too, which I would, you know, love to hear a little bit about from you is the setup and the story and the castle, right. which to me, again, reminds me of Forbidden Journey, but also even more than like Transformers, which feels almost like you're walking into a big box or even Spider-Man, their exteriors are not as amazing where this is really cool from the start. Yeah. And stop me because I'm about to go on a massive <laughs> historical journey. No, for go you, for it. But... I like it. Yeah, so so for those of you who maybe don't know, Bush Gardens Parks, uh, both the Tampa and the Williamsburg ones, um, have always tried to capitalize on the same type of immersive theming of parks like Disney and Universal, but just on a regional scale. Um, so Bush Gardens, Williamsburg, aka the old country, as it used to be known, realized that the best way to theme its rides were going to be off of stories and legends. Um, so that they didn't have to really deal with like the IP constraints that places like Disney and Universal do. So um, when you're, you know, theming a ride off of the Black Forest or something like that, then you don't have to worry about, you know, changing hands, which is something that some other regional parks like uh, King's Dominion, for example, has had to deal with when it changes from being a Paramount-owned park to not a Paramount-owned park, et cetera. So uh, Busch Gardens Williamsburg is divided into hamlets, uh, and each of these hamlets is representative of Italy, Ireland, France, England, Scotland, and Germany, each having their own authentic architecture, entertainment, food, craftsmanship, et cetera, representing the wonders of the old world. It also has a Canada section or New France section, but that one's somewhat less old feeling, but still technically there. Um, so the theming of the park is a really good companion to the nearby Colonial Williamsburg. In this uh, ride is situated inside the Germany section of the park. And um, what they do is they use this legend of the mad <laughs> King Ludwig, uh, who is a real person, as the idea to take a dark ride and turn it into a haunted house. So where the Spider-Man ride or the Transformers ride sort of loosely follows the, the idea of a story from, you know, comic book characters, movie characters, they thought, hey, let's build a castle and build at least the front facade to look like a real castle. It's got turrets. It's got um, the queue winds through a like hedge area with sculptures of 
wolves. And that's probably been one of the most impressive things is that you're walking through this Germany section of the park and there's this massive, creepy, dark castle uh, right in front of you that has not gone away. Um, it, you know, now that we've got Dark Coaster, it's still there. But even in the years between the two, that castle was always still there. And everyone's kind of walking by wondering, man, this is a, this is a really cool building. It's a shame that there is nothing in it at this point. So the, uh, yeah, the story that they, they use is this, this story of this King who kind of on a surface level, it's got some like beauty and the beast kind of lore to it as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the story was this King who, who reigned from 1864 to 1886 in Bavaria. And then he died mysteriously after reaching such debt that he was deemed insane and was taken into custody. And then he was found in a lake uh, at one of his castles soon after. And it was ruled a suicide by drowning, even though there was no water in his lungs and he was known to be a strong swimmer. It's, it's a little, little creepy, that real story. Um, but that's that's where they came up with the idea of this ride. And uh, so the, the ride history really is that, um, you know, this was going to be the second ever installation of a 4D roving motion-based dark ride after the Spider-Man ride. So um, Oceaneering International, which is a subsea research equipment manufacturer, uh, they were the ones who had created the original system for the Amazing Spider-Man ride. And so they they return and do a similar idea for Dark Castle. Uh, the one change mostly being that the ride it ends up being a, a little smaller. So I think Amazing Spider-Man has like 12 person containers um, and it uses these hydraulic pistons to control the degrees of motion. And um, Dark Castle, the ride uh, vehicle is it's sort of like a, a circular bench um, or a, a circular container with two rows of like stadium seating with four seats in each. So eight. Um, and I, I read that they use uh, pneumatic airbags instead of the pistons to uh, change the degrees of motion. Uh, and I know that we were talking pre-show that, you know, that uh, super 78 studios and then this uh, manufacturer group called Falcons creative are, those are the two um, entities that come together to design the in-ride footage and then the in-ride mechanics um, that have to be synced together uh, in order to sort of <laughs> like display the theming of the ride. Um, neither of those groups worked on Spider-Man, so they had to kind of reinvent the wheel a little bit for the process. But that's that's the the groups there that that build these squinching technique that I talked about before. <laughs> Yeah, I talked to Brent Young, who's like the head of Super 78, um, way early in the podcast. He's also co-host of the Season Pass podcast, um, which is a long-running, they don't do many episodes now, but a long-running theme park podcast. They do basically mostly video, though I know they've done some other things. And I remember him talking about how challenging this was at the time. But um, the squinching, I remember now, because I talked to Adam Bizarre, who worked on Spider-Man, and he talked all about how difficult that was to, to like train your brain where you're looking kind of at the screen and also it doesn't, everyone would get sick. I mean, this was something mm -hmm. that came up with star tours before they even had a deal with having to move. All that being said, from your perspective, um, because you know, there's a lot of rides now, like your justice league, six flags rides where it's like, you go to a screen, you shoot at the screen, you go to another screen, you shoot at the screen, but there's not the in between, but how did this work for you? I mean, was it a, as cool as it looked online to someone who hasn't written it in person? I mean, was it, did people love it there from your memory? Ah, uh, well, therein lies the whole crux of Curse of Dark Castle, which was, it was great when it first came out. So it, it debuts in May of 2005 and um, it its first year, it's like, bringing in the long lines. Um, it's billed as a family attraction, but it's also kind of like this haunted spooky thing. So um, you kind of get like a little bit of the thrills while still being a family ride. Uh, it's also I, the only dark ride. I would call it real dark ride. Like Bush Gardens has had its forays into the uh, like spider or um, Star Wars sort of you're in you're in a box watching a 3D video kind right. of thing. I don't really consider that to be a dark ride, but this was really the the first and only dark ride at Bush Gardens and 
still, they haven't put another one in, um, which when you go to like Disney world and you're riding, you know, it's a small world and, and all the other classic boat rides or dark rides, you just wonder why they don't have more of those at regional parks because they're, I don't know. It just seems like they, they would be my go-to of like, okay, I'm building a park. I got to get at least one of these in here, but the upkeep is, is a lot. So, um, Curse of Dark Castle itself actually replaced a, a coaster called Wa- the Wild Mouse, which itself has had like four different renamings. <laughs> um, and uh, that, that was like a cat and mouse style coaster, which eventually moved to Tampa uh, Bush Gardens and was renamed Sand Serpent. That one just closed this past June, actually. So that one, uh, I, I think like that one was in 1996 was when it was in Bush Gardens. So it spent like 10 years in Bush Gardens and then moved to Bush or Bush Gardens, Williamsburg, then moved to Tampa. So that sort of section of the park had already had a lot of things come in and out. Um, I think before wild mouse, there was like a car ride there at one point. Um, one of those like old fashioned yeah. car rides. The thing about curse of Dark castle, like I said, is that it, it opened great. It had, um, you know, this, this cold, dark castle building. Um, and then you had a, a pre-show with a video where it would tell you the whole story of the Black Forest and King Ludwig. And um, the whole kind of like gist of the ride is that you are a party guest coming to Ludwig's uh, castle. And um, his mom is trying to warn you to go away. There's clearly some like allusions to is Ludwig a shapeshifter? Can he turn into a wolf? He's got some sort of magic power, but it only exists within inside the castle. So his mom is constantly trying to get you to leave and, and get out because all the party guests who come uh, are never seen again. Um, so you're, you're sort of taken on this golden sleigh ride through the castle and through the grounds and then terror reigns pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so the ride part is, it was pretty cool to begin with. I know that I wrote it very quickly after it opened, um, after reading through the original, uh, ride description and then watching the videos again, a lot of it seemed, um, very familiar, but there were a couple of things I noticed were different. And so I discovered that in 2006, they actually, redid elements of the ride. So it opened, it was great, had that cutting edge technology, but the overall consensus from most of the riders were "Mm, not that scary, not that thrilling. Maybe, maybe utilize some of the technology a little more Um, because these ride contraptions uh, that that are um, at least in the uh, Spider-Man one are referred to as scoop technology. I don't know. I, but a lot the of acronyms. vehicles, yeah, <laughs> those ones, I couldn't figure out what it stood for, but <laughs> that's <laughs> out <not>? there. <laughs> so the scoop, uh, ride contraptions, they, they can do some like pretty heavy duty, like lurching, moving, uh, tilting, that kind of thing. So Bush gardens had prepared for the idea that they might need to change some things. So, um, the studio 78 and Falcon creative, um, basically had built in the ability to wirelessly swap out scenes and ride sections and reprogram the motion. So they, uh, super 78 reanimated a lot of the scenes in the, in the ride. And then some changes happened. So in 2006, only a year after it being open, they changed several elements of the ride to make it more thrilling. The main one that I remember after reading about it was that there's a part where you're sort of going along, you're, you think you're going through a hallway. And then all of a sudden Ludwig pulls you basically using magic, pulls you into a fireplace that has fire shooting up into it. The fire dims right as you go into the fireplace. And in the first iteration of the ride, you would sort of go through the fireplace out into the other side and you'd be in a ballroom and there would be this ballroom scene in the revamped version, you'd enter the fireplace, spin around really quickly in the motion that feels like you're getting sucked up into the fireplace. And then all of a sudden you're on the roof. So they sort of tweak some of the scenes, get rid of the ballroom scene. Now you're on the roof. And uh, a lot of those sort of classic like 3D dark ride features that you think of now, that feeling of the video makes it look like you're hanging you know, you're about to mm. fall. They put that element in. So you're zooming around. You've got these effects like you're going to fall to your death. 
uh, crashing, landing, that kind of thing. Um, so they, they revamped a lot of that. It did have the downside of like some of the original story of the ride. It was a lot of this back and forth between Ludwig and his mom. And as movies tend to be, you know, they, they sacrificed some of the plot and story elements, uh, and the pacing in order to have a, a more, I don't know, thrilling experience. So that kind of, while that seemed great, I believe that some of those changes were sort of, <laughs> Even though it had only been open for a year, it's the beginning of the end for Dark Castle and like the the downfall of um, the technology. So what ended up happening was this update was made. It was a great headliner. Everything's great. But then by the 2010s, so only after, you know, five or six years of it being open, things started to change at Dark Castle again, but this time not for the better. So while the park ends up discontinuing the pre-show part of the ride, uh, because, you know, they don't want to have to hold people in a room for two minutes to listen to the spiel. But because of that, they would just play the video on a loop and guests could walk through and decide if they wanted to watch it. So many guests now lost the backstory and the context for what's happening on the ride, which made the ride a bit more confusing and disorienting for a lot of the riders. And then also in the decades since it opens, uh, the wear and tear seemed to take a toll on the ride system itself. So the scoop vehicles uh, combined with motion sickness, spilled beverages, et cetera, forced engineers to tone down the ride. So we had a ride, they ramped it up (laughs) and now they're having to tone it down. So I remember the dizzying, like spinning uh, highlight of going into the fireplace was removed. And I don't know exactly when it happened, but I remember vividly that part of the ride and then coming back in, you know, the mid to late 2010s and it was gone. And I'm like, wait a second, didn't we used to spin around here? Now we just kind of (laughs) go through that. Like, what is this? This is lame. And so, yeah. And I just figured it was like, maybe they, maybe it just broke. Maybe this feature didn't work. Um, and like these, these vehicles that I mentioned, they can slam, they can buck back and forth. Um, all of a sudden they're much tamer. It's just kind of slight jostles to the side and you're like, okay, whatever. Some of the physical effects, the triggered props, the videos stopped working. Uh, the 2006 animation by like 2014, it's not really holding up in a, in a HD world. This is another one that I vividly remember, but like the whole point of that squinching and 3D video is so that certain elements happen that are supposed to look, you know, they're supposed to look scary, but not actually break the story. So for example, they would throw knives at you and the knives are supposed to look like they're just barely whizzing by your head based on your 3D glasses and how the video is. But now the knives would look like they go straight into your head, <laughs> which like doesn't make any sense in terms of the video. It's just kind of weird um cuz you know that it's not hitting you. So that was another one that I vividly remember is like, wait a second. Something something seems a little off with with the animation here. So all of that combined just kind of eventually took its toll. Uh, you know, it was either too costly to maintain or they decided that it wasn't thrilling enough. So there's no reason to keep it. Long story short, it ends up, you know, they end up having, um, I think 2017 was the last time it was open. And, um, then by, I guess that the 2018 was when they announced it's not coming back for this season. Cause that was something else was that this ride as a dark ride could be open during some of their off-season events. Bush Gardens only in the last like two years has become a year-round park. Uh, but up until 2021, it was a season, a seasonal park. Um, but they do their Christmas town off-season event. And this ride, uh, Dark Castle, was being used during that time because it was indoors, it was a escape from the cold. Um, and it also sort of has this weird mix of being a Halloween and Christmas or winter themed ride, because there's a lot of like frozen motifs and elements in the ride while also being a haunted house. So it fit in perfectly with both Hallow Scream and Christmas Town. But all of a sudden in around 2014, they start, you start noticing that it's closed during both Hallow Scream and Christmas Town. Some of the times when it would be most appropriate to be open, it closes. Um, they use it as a, 
like a, like a Santa's workshop meet and greet <laughs> with Santa during uh, the Christmas time. And then they announce that it's going to be a haunted house during Hell Scream, which if any any <laughs> big fan of um, theme parks know that once a building starts being used as a haunted house, it's kind of the kiss of death mm. <laughs> for that ride for the most part. Um, so they, they made it into a, uh, a haunted house called frostbite, which was, uh, used from 2017 to 2019. And then from 2019 to 2000. And I mean, until, until 2023, it was nothing like it was just a building there. You could walk by it. It was the, the beautiful, you know, set was there. But besides being a, a meet and greet for Santa, it was nothing else, which was also kind of weird. Yeah. Like, like if this is like a creepy building with it, it still has the like creepy hedges and the, um, you know, it's, it's like a spooky castle. And it's like, oh, here's Santa. It just doesn't really fit. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. Like, you know, um, you got the area for Mad King Ludwig and it's like, Go to Santa's workshop in the scary castle. It's like, what? Why are they? You know, I don't yeah. understand. Because it probably, given that it was used for a hollow scream, probably also had that kind of, they, they kept the creepy vibe on the outside. Yeah. So it's, it's like, what? I guess, you know, you got to use what you have. You got a cool castle. Why not put Santa in there? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, th- I think just probably for, for foot traffic, they needed something in between the Oktoberfest and Germany sections of the park. But um, so it was something that uh, I think you mentioned the last time I was on talking with you that I was like, ah, I just want them to put something in that yeah. building because it's still there. Yeah, and they did. They put something in. Well, I, I should mention the effects too, because that's something I've noticed with, I mentioned Justice League, which is not the same type of ride, but it's it's the only dark ride at Six Flags St. Louis, which is not a great park. But half the time when you ride it, the screens are just off. And you're like, yeah. okay, I'm ready to shoot to save Superman or Batman, and there's nothing. And then you move on. Or the Joker's supposed to shoot stuff at you, and he just stands there. So I think these regional parks have a really hard time because they don't budget enough for the operations. Because mm-hmm. that's also oceaneering ride vehicles, and they always have problems with the rides. And so it's not oceaneering's fault. It's that I probably underestimate the amount of money something like Spider-Man or Transformers or Forbidden Journey, I'm sure, costs to maintain. It's probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and who knows if it even might even be higher. Sure. I mean, even just like animatronic type things, like picture <laughs> picture having a cuckoo clock and then probably you use it for years and years and eventually stops working. Like you need to repair that. You need to have some upkeep. Um, you know, you're if you have one of those music boxes with a little ballerina that spins around. So even forgetting the like high technology right. 3D videos, just even like a a dark ride that goes through more or less practical props are still going to need a lot of upkeep. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, let's get to the Dark Coaster, which opened in May of um, this year. Well, before yes. I do that, though, I'm going to try something here, which is I'm going to play for us and for you, the listener, a short clip. Because last May of 2022, there were rumors already out about something called the Dark Coaster, which was going to go into this building. And wow, were we excited, Mary. So I'm going to play this clip for us, Mary, which is um, several minutes. It's from way back in the ancient times of May 2022, where we were talking about our excitement for this rumor. So here we go, Mary. Let's listen to this. An indoor family launch roller coaster. People are calling this the Dark Coaster, but I don't think that's the real name. That's just what people are referring to as. Might be ready next year, 2023. If this happens, is this exciting for you that they may use that space for something that sounds kind of cool? I am so much more excited about this one. This is amazing (laughs) news. I've always had hopes that they would put something back in there because they've never torn down the castle facade. They've used that building for haunted houses, but they, and they've used it for like meet and greets with Santa Claus. They use it for a lot of purposes because I think they know it's a really cool looking building and it's at a really prime, like it's got prime real estate in the middle of the park, uh, right in the middle of Germany and Oktoberfest. So it's a great spot. I think that the, a, any kind kind of family coaster inside. I mean, I would have been fine with any style of dark ride. Like the the dark ride that they had previously was heavy on the 3D animation and that sort of thing. Guys, there's nothing wrong with going back to like a 
haunted mansion style <laughs> dark ride too. People like that. You know, you got to have more family rides that are not just thrown into the you know, like Sesame Street area. Like it's perfectly fine to have, you know, middle school age rides. But I, I think a, a launch coaster is something that's definitely possible considering they have a very similar style indoor ride right over at King's Dominion, um, which is sort of King's Dominion's version of the uh, Space Mountain. It's kind of a similar idea. So doing a similar launch coaster in this building would be great. I, I would be excited for anything. I would say stick to practical theming if if you're going to do that remove any kind of <laughs> AR, VR, 3D elements, and I think you're going to have a, a good time. But even if it's just a rumor, I'm glad that they're not demolishing the building. I would be excited for anything. That is the quote that you gave, Mary, on that. Wow. Here's what I've learned after listening to that. Um, I just <laughs> recycle all my same notes clearly because <laughs> I mentioned most of the same things. Uh, look, I would always rather there be a ride than not be a ride in the park. Um, I stand by the the fact that there's prime real estate there. I stand by the fact that having an indoor ride is great for weather concerns. It's funny to think that we were joking about it being called Dark Coaster, and yeah, that yes. is actually what they called it. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite part, where I was just like, they're not going to call it that. There's no way. It's like, yeah, yeah, they are. So that's the background. We were really excited. And not that we're not excited at all now, but yeah, when you have, hey, this is true of Disney, too. They still have spots where they del- mm-hmm. they remove this terrible spinning coaster at Animal Kingdom, and now there's nothing there but picnic tables. And I'm like, put something there. Do anything. But here, it's interesting because they did put in an indoor launch coaster, brand new, like I said, from Intamin with launches and everything. And the concept art looks so cool. But you experienced it. So I would love to know about your experience, you know, going and riding it, and then I'll have some more questions about the specifics. All right. So (laughs) here's the thing about the ride. It's just okay. It's not a bad ride. If you're, what I would consider to be a bad ride would be a rough ride or a extremely lame ride where there's no thrill at all. It's neither of those. It feels like the beta version of a ride that just needs some tweaks. It feels like a ride that you're riding before they've put theming in and they have put theming in. Then the other problem with the ride is that there were a lot of things they hyped up about the ride, uh, especially in the format of calling it a straddle coaster. (sighs) It's not what I would refer to as a straddle coaster. The ride vehicle is supposed to look like a snowmobile or like a jet ski, basically. I thought that you would be actually straddling a seat like you would a jet ski or a snowmobile. Um, but instead you're basically sitting on a chair <laughs> with your legs slightly to the side. <laughs> like it's not, it's not really the, the vehicle itself was probably the biggest letdown for me just because that was hyped up. Um, the whole straddle seat thing. If you look at pictures, you can tell that you're, you're basically just sitting in a chair and that the part that your legs are supposedly straddling There's not really anything actually between your, I mean, there sort of is, but it's at ground level. It's really not, it's not really what it was hyped up to be. You, you can't even, um, your hands can't like, you can, you can physically reach forward and grab the handlebars, but you don't need to, you could easily just sort of sit up and down like a chair (laughs) for the ride, um, which is more what most people do when riding it. Uh, the biggest, so the, the ride itself is, um, you know, it's a, it's a launch style coaster. It's pretty interesting because the space that it's utilizing while a big building for a dark ride is a small building for a roller coaster. So the, um, the coaster, uh, uses the show building and it uses a switch track function so that it's a one track that the train navigates twice and then only goes back to the station once. So a a switch happens in the track, uh, to navigate that that twice. And then, um, which was not something I even realized while riding it initially, uh, until partway through the ride, I wrote it right after it opened in, I, I think early June is when I wrote it. And then I wrote it again in August. Um, both times I wrote it, the first time I wrote it, I, I went to the park very quickly at the beginning. Um, 
And so I really didn't have to wait in the queue very long. Uh, There wasn't any sort of like pre-show story, although there was sound being pumped through that sort of told you this similar story of, of Ludwig. It's supposed to be kind of using a lot of those same lore elements. The second time I wrote it, I had a, a quick cue for it. So neither time did I have to wait very long. I would put the, uh, I mean, if you just want to check it off the list, I'd say anything under an hour is okay. But in terms of if you're if you've ridden it before and you want to go back and ride it, I wouldn't wait longer than thirty minutes for it. I'm a <laughs> I'm a sucker for short lines, and I I tend to strategically go to the park oh, yeah. on days when you basically have no lines. So sure to to walk onto the ride, it's fine. But the main issue in the ride is the fact that it's it's dark, like a uh, Space Mountain or the uh, King's Dominion equivalent, like I mentioned in that <laughs> clip, but it's it's too dark to see any kind of surprising elements. Like the way that they use the dark building in Verbolton works so much better for some reason. I think because they have sort of like lightning flash type lighting elements. And from my memory of Dark Coaster, they've got they had one sort of thing that lit up and I'm like, what was that? What we were going by too fast. I couldn't even tell what it was supposed to be. I think maybe using, adding a little more light and then putting in some more practical things like some big wolf sculptures would have been cool. I don't know. I think that they, I, I felt like they just need to add to it. If they just add a little bit more theming, um, maybe make some more like music or sound effects, then that would enhance it quite a lot. Uh, the actual ride part, you know, it feels like a, like a launch coaster that's indoors. So it's not, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, super surprising there, but the, the hype was real leading up to this ride. They really capitalized on that. Um, Bush gardens did like uh, special days where they allowed guests to come in and view the storyboards and the blueprints and the artwork used social media was used to name the two trains for the ride um, which all of the options, I did some research into this cause all the options were, uh, callbacks to, to the former dark castle thing. So like, uh, the two that they went with, um, for the two trains, in case you're interested, uh, one train is called frostbite, uh, 1719, which I believe is because of the frostbite, <laughs> which was the haunted house in that building from 2017, 2019, uh, oh, wild, wild wolf, uh, 9684 is the name of the other train. Um, and that is a combination of the four, the two former Germany rides, big bad wolf and wild mouse, uh, that, opened in 1984 and 1996 respectively and then the other options they didn't go for were Bavarian Blitz 0505 which was a reference to Dark Castle opening in May of 2005 and King Ludwig uh, 2023 which was a reference to Dark Coaster's opening date. Um, Busch Gardens really loves to name its its rides and its ride cars off of nostalgic uh, material so if you've if you've ever looked at the names of the cars in Verbolton, you'll notice that they're all references to Big Bad Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they like they like their history. Well, you mentioned you didn't wait very long. And um, yeah, I looked at the queue, like on ride videos, the queue for it. And there was like, it looked like they're really leaning into the snowmobile thing. And it's like a bunch of, like, it looked like they had a bunch of broken vehicles and snow things. And I was like, okay, I don't really totally, I mean, it was a lot of stuff. It's a lot of things. You know, we talked about this with Pantheon, the queue, and how, like, well, they did, they had some signs there. But here, I mean, I think they did a little more, and it looked like there was one sort of like holographic defect coming out of one, of, like, of King, but I didn't totally get that either. But so it didn't seem as strong. But I also want to ask you because I have read that lines for this overall are like it, it holds what I read was 350 riders an hour, which seems quite low even for a roller coaster i mean that seems like very low but again maybe it's not for a regional park kind of coaster but have you heard that the lines overall for this have gotten really long because i feel like that could really influence it too like we see at disney world with seven Dwarfs mine train where people like it but they get very annoyed when they wait two hours for it i think my gut from the times i've been there i've been there three times since it opened um and the last time i didn't ride it because the lines were like an hour long at least. 
is that right now it's still doing the people who haven't ridden it yet, writing it for the first time lines. When I wrote it, all the other people in line hadn't wrote, written it yet. And everyone kind of walked away going, oh, that was okay. I'll, I'll write it again if the line's ever short. Right. So that's kind of what I've heard. Um, it's, it's two trains of 10, but only one train can go at a time. So loading one while the other one is, is on the ride. The ride itself, um, I don't know if you have this stat. It didn't feel particularly long. Maybe, maybe a minute, if that, for the actual length of the ride. So yeah, I mean, when you're dealing with only 20 people over the course of with loading and unloading, I don't know, six or seven minutes. Yeah. It's not, it's not great. (laughs) Not great in terms of, uh, load time. Now I know that when I rode Pantheon the first time I timed it and it took a very long time to load and it has sped up. It seems like their ride operations have gotten better, but that one's also just sort of a, a bigger, more impressive ride in general. Sorry, I was trying to look up, and I think I read it. I have not found a definitive how long it is, but what I've seen from some ride videos and stuff, they generally fall in like a minute 45, minute 50, if two minutes at most, or something in that range. So it's pretty short. And the fact that it's going around twice, that is one short track. Yeah. I have to say, if it's that, I mean, I know it's launching. Yeah, I was under the impression there was going to be a lot more theming. And to me, I mean, they could update it. Typically, you don't see places do stuff like that. But I feel like, I mean, I say that we're about to talk about something that's getting updated for this type of thing. I feel like, I don't know if they ran out of money or what, but I mean, cause there's, from what I could see online, I'm sure there's, there's like one where it looks like you're going through a big face, which looked impressive, but then the rest of it just like some lighting, like you said, as you fly by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The theming is just really minimal. And I, I don't know if it's a ran out of money. They plan to add more to it later. I think probably their thought was let's open it, see what people think. If people complain, maybe we'll add to it. <laughs> um, I'm reading through some Reddit posts now, and it seems like most people are basically like, yeah, it was fine. It was, you know, I'm glad that they put something there is basically what it is. Um, they say, you know, not worth, not worth a two or three hour wait, but you know, it's, it's great to have an indoor ride. Indoor rides are good at, at any park, but especially parks that don't have a lot of them. So that is very true. So last question, I think on this, unless you have more to add, but there's eight coasters at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. Where does this fall in terms of, I wouldn't say thrills, but for you personally, in terms of like where you would put it you know, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. I mean, I think in terms of coasters, it's, it's like, unless you really hate rough rides, it's definitely the least thrilling of the park. Like it's definitely the least, Mm. here's where I'd put it (laughs) in Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. (laughs) I put it above, um, uh, Tempesto because I hate Tempesto because Tempesto is not an original ride. It's a, uh, pre-built place in an indoor park ride. Um, Mm -hmm. but other than that, I I could definitely see myself going to Bush Gardens and skipping it. It's it's the kind of thing where I'd ride it if it was a short line. I'd ride it if I was there with people who hadn't ridden it before. Like I, I do disagree with the idea that it's a bad ride. It's not a bad ride. It's just kind of a meh ride. I think the expectations were so high too. I think that's kind of a yeah. killer. People really were hoping for like I think the like you said, the marketing really pushed it too. Yeah. People were hoping for something great. And I think the problem is when you realistically think that you're putting a roller coaster inside a building that was used for a dark ride, it's small. There's just not a ton of space. I don't think that there is anything they could have done unless you're put making like a wild mouse uh, or a cat and mouse style ride. The area is too small to not reuse track. Like you pretty much have to reuse track. And if they, uh, otherwise it would need to be like basically a kitty style ride. So I think it's, I think it's fine. Like my preference would have been put a dark ride back in there, like just do a different dark ride. Like, um, I think Bush Gardens has this problem, which makes sense of, it wants to get, it wants to get butts in seats. Right. So it wants to do marketing where they can say the first ever straddle seated (laughs) indoor launch ride, like, right. They want to say that they want to say that Pantheon is the first, you know, whatever triple launch roller coaster to get whatever stats are, Mm -hmm. um, because they want people to come check it out. And sometimes that gets people there. It doesn't always get people to stay there. We saw that, that big flaw with the, um, the VRI that they had was they were the first park to put a VRI in. Nobody really liked the VRI. So 
That's, that is what it is. <laughs> and the last one. No, unfortunately, that's <laughs> not true. Yeah. That's what I think they've been doing, like we see even with some of the other, I mean, they've had some great rides at some of their other parks, um, Bush in general, mm-hmm. with like Iron Gwazi. And, but when they've tried to do dark rides, even like at SeaWorld, they tried to do that Antarctica mm-hmm. ride, which apparently everybody hated. Yep. And I watched the video and I'm like, I can't believe that's really what it is. And they're replacing it with an indoor coaster or with a, not indoor at all, but like a family coaster. So they're really just, I think they've had bad luck or I don't know, I wouldn't call it luck, but bad experiences with some dark rides that now they just like, we know if we build a coaster, people will show up. I think. Yeah. And, and like, I really do stand by that. It's, it's better to have something in there and it's, it's not that bad of a ride. I think that it, there's definitely room for improvement. And to my limited knowledge about how roller coasters work room for relatively inexpensive, easy improvement, you know, add, add a little, add just some more effects. Like it's, it's like when you're playing roller coaster tycoon and then you're like, yeah, if I just put some statues around here, now there's a theming, <laughs> like just do that. Like, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, just like I, my coaster has some dinosaurs and those pirates and everything. It doesn't matter. Yeah, they like it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's cool. Something like that. But yeah, they, they really did go all out with the marketing. They, um, they released a limited edition dark coaster, black logger created to commemorate the opening of the ride. And, uh, that was a collaboration with the Virginia Beer Company mm. is a traditional German style Schwartz beer uh, with hints of cho- uh, chocolate and coffee. I did not have it. I don't know if they still have it there, but <laughs> I, I did not try it. But it's, uh, you know, like I like the fact that it builds on the lore of King Ludwig. I, so the the uh, concept for this one is that the castle has been abandoned and is crumbling in the snow. And uh, so you are are traveling through the abandoned fortress um, and you encounter some supernatural ghostly forces, which, you know, may, maybe they maybe they just weren't working well when I wrote <laughs> it. But like, I, I just felt like there should be a little bit more. I'm totally with you. Well, I want to talk about quickly the other news from Bush yes. Gardens Williamsburg which is they are going to, which I love, I like news like this because I feel like, you know, don't replace a classic. Let's make it better. But Loch Ness Monster roller coaster is going to be enhanced with not only a restoration, speaking of possibly being rough, restoration of a track, because that's an old aero coaster that opened in 1978 yes. with the interlocking loops, which I know is the only one basically now. Uh, but they're going to add effects. They're going to update the pre show. They're going to add, create a new soundtrack. It's a little hard to read, but I think they're going to have some sort of additional monster when you go down the first drop. I don't totally understand exactly how that's going to go, but maybe you understand it better. But what do you think about this? The fact that they are going to, you know, I'm curious for your thoughts on the current Loch Ness Monster Coaster, but also Mm -hmm. how excited are you that they're going to invest some money to really make it something, you know, to update it? Loch Ness Monster is fascinating. It is, uh, it was my first roller coaster that I ever rode. and it's a ride that every time I go to the park, I try to ride it. I'm a classic Sunday Bush Gardens goer, so I like to avoid the lines. But the few times that I've been recently on Fridays or Saturdays, what I notice is it has massive lines still, especially on Saturdays, especially peak season. Um, it is a ride that clearly people who are coming from far away have either heard about or more likely remember from when they were a kid and want to ride it again. When you go on a Sunday, part of the reason why there's not as many lines is most of the people who live around here who have those season passes, I think, no, yeah, it's a little rougher compared to everything else now, you know, it's, it's an aero coaster. Uh, it's going to be rough. It's going to have those awkward elements, but it is, it's beautiful to look at in the park. It goes right around the water. It's got those interlocking loops. It's got an indoor, uh, dark cave section. They actually recently, uh, repainted all of the track and supports. Um, so it, it looks relatively f- fresh right now compared to, you know, how it had looked maybe four or five years ago. But yeah, I mean, this this coaster has been there for 46 years and uh, they're closing at the time of recording this. They haven't closed yet, but they're going to close at the end of October of this year and uh, then reopen question mark sometime in 2024. They keep saying 2024, but they won't get any more specific than that. So we're not sure. Um, and of course they're doing, you know, members will be the last ones to ride uh, in the first week of November and they'll be the first to ride uh, in 2024. So the the new elements 
I'm definitely looking forward to uh, Loch Ness Monster actually has a relatively interesting queue theming area, pre-show area. But um, unless you're there peak season on a Saturday, you don't even walk through it anymore because you kind of bypass all that for the short lines. Um, so I'm excited to see how they incorporate that into the the line queue again. Themed queues are such an easy thing to do, it seems like, and something that I still can't figure out why they don't have everywhere. It's one of my biggest complaints about some of the rides at um, Disney World. Like there is no reason why when you're standing in a two hour line for Soren that you're not watching a projection of a Disney movie. That is the worst line. (laughs) I wanted Epcot is just the worst. You're just standing in a blank hallway and I still can't figure out why they don't put anything there. There's no excuse for Disney not just projecting its own movies on all the queues. Well, I mean, anything. They're so It's so cheap. I mean, those hallways. Oh, man. I could. Well, even they have their coaster, Slinky Dog Dash, where you stand outside and go through switchbacks. I'm like, what are we at? Six Flags? What's going on? Do something. So, yeah, that, yeah. that's a side note. But, yeah, it is really cool, especially to see a park like Bush Gardens to be focusing on let's make a cool pre-show and add to kind of the story and the lore, which is really cool. Yeah. And I, and I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do in terms of the track replacements. I'll, I'll be there, you know, I'll try to go a couple of times this winter and early spring to see if I can actually catch any of it in action, because I'm curious, you know, I don't know that there's going to be much that they're going to be able to change to make it less rough without basically just redesigning it. But that being said, the Loch Ness Monster part that you're talking about, my guess is that they're going to put some sort of Nessie sculpture type thing in the water, which is something that they don't have. Honestly, kind of like, why haven't you had this? <laughs> That'd be a pr- Again, just put the sculpture in. It, it so wouldn't fast. be hard. <laughs> it's like you just have to see it for like three seconds. <laughs> yeah, but it is one of the one of the best uh, photo op areas in the whole park is walking down by the water where you can get a view of at least three roller coasters going by at once. So um, I think it'll be cool uh, to have that. So yeah, it says uh, it says while braving the first drop, catch a glimpse of something monstrous lurking under the water. So I don't know, maybe they'll maybe they'll put something there. I'm they definitely put, looking forward to it. They just put like an inflatable in the water and it's like, there it is. <laughs> it's like that's like 50 bucks, you know? It's easy. Just put it in there, you know. Now, I think it'll be a little more than that, but probably I'm, a little bit more. We'll <laughs> see. A little bit. We'll see what they do. Well, that's exciting though. I'm excited to see them. I mean, obviously they had like for like Big Bad Wolf, that was one where Verbolton was really cool and people really like it, so it was a cool replacement, but it's nice to have this one where they're keeping it not that I thought it would go away, but a lot of the old arrows have gone away because they got so rough and uncomfortable. You, there's one at Six Flags St. Louis, the Ninja, which is like, oh my gosh, the corkscrews and bloops are terrible. So I'm glad yeah. to see that they're even, no matter what they can do with the track, they're going to do something to make it as nice as it can be. Yeah, the the uh, the cars themselves are are very cramped. So I don't know if they're going to find a way to <laughs> fix that, but I don't know. That would be something to look into. Straddle coaster. That's what they got. No, do. oh my gosh, <laughs> not a thing. Fake straddle coaster. Yeah. In a chair. Just, so then they can announce it's like the only straddle coaster with interlocking loops or <laughs> something. Just, just you know, anything oh you can put up on the screen. Exactly. Right. Well, speaking of changes, I mean, we have heard some announcements of what's coming in 2024 um, from whether it's you know, mostly from like your regional parks and everything. Is there something that's been announced for next year or even that just came out that you haven't done that you're like really excited to do? So this is not necessarily new, but it's new to me. Um, I haven't been to uh, Disney. What, I don't even know what it's called. Hollywood Studios. I haven't been there since it's been called Disney Hollywood Studios. Wow. So uh, yeah, <laughs> the last time I went was in 2007 when it was still called MGM. And so I'm going in January and I'm really excited to experience all of the Star Wars stuff that I haven't gotten yeah. a chance to see. So not new, but new to me, definitely. It's funny because last year you mentioned that you wanted to do the Star Wars thing. So I'm <laughs> yeah. glad that we're continuing. I'm going. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's great. You get to do that. I'm trying to think. Oh, they also have um, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. is a really cool, cool, cute dark ride there. And then the whole Toy Story area is there, which yeah, I, I just mentioned Slicky Dog Dash. Speaking of launch coasters, you know, just <laughs> very exciting. I don't know if, there's, if there will be anything that's the same. I mean, I guess like, uh, what is it? Fantasmic or fa- well, whatever that rock one is. Rock and Roller Coaster. Coaster is still there. If you, I don't know if you did that though. I don't think I did it when I was um, a kid. Yeah. Speaking of indoor coasters with a launch, and then um, 
Tower of Terror is still there. So okay. the, those two down right. at the end were both now is, there. Is this one in Florida, it's still Tower of Terror yes, themed? it's not okay. Guardians of the Galaxy like <laughs> okay. California, which is fun. I did that um, this year. But yes, it's still the original Tower of Terror and then Rock and Roller Coaster. So those two beyond... Oh, and, and um, no, actually, you wouldn't have done Toy Story Mania because that opened up no. after. So wow, wow. That brand new 2008 brand new for me. <laughs> eight ride for you. All I will say about that is... Um, they don't have that many rides, so the lines for those get very long. So either okay, really that. get there early. I mean, again, it depends on the day and crowds and all that. Or, you know, I hate to say it, or buy their Genie Plus and all the other oh things my gosh. to skip the line. Because... Now, are you being a big uh, big fan of, of all, themes, all things theme park, have you watched the um, Defunct Land Disney Fast Pass video? Yeah, okay, of course. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's great. Yeah, I um that it makes me a little sad when I watch yeah, it. Yeah, it is sad. It, you're like you look at it and you're like, and that was even you know now we've had several years of this Genie Plus and and also for example the Star Wars ride Rise of the Resistance where you can you have to pay individually if you don't want to wait in line for that. So um yeah, it's it's something I can we can go off track, but I will say yeah that park in particular. All the things that are brought up in that Defunct Land video really stand out because that park has like eight headliners and nothing else. So it's, I mean, there's Star Tours that has a shorter line. The other, you know what they need? An indoor launch coaster. (laughs) They actually have one of those. But yes, they need another one (laughs) with amazing theming, a straddle coaster um, Uh themed to um, King Ludwig. No, Um, (laughs) they could talk to Intamin. I'm sure they could get it for cheap. All right, staying focused here. Is there something you've written in the past year or so, um, or even further back, if not, but that you've really enjoyed that maybe you experienced for the first time? And don't say Dark Coaster. That does not count. No, but this is, okay, I'm cheating a little because it's not a ride. But uh, here is something that Bush Gardens has added recently that I give two giant thumbs up to, which is the Burgermeister's Hideaway. Highly recommend. I've been twice now. Probably it's the kind of thing most people don't need to do more than once in their life but I recommend it. So they've added in a speakeasy style, uh, sort of part show, part speakeasy experience um, that you can go to. You have to book in advance uh, in peak season, definitely book like two weeks in advance when you know you're going, but you you go, you book either uh, beer, wine, cocktail, or mocktail flights. They are four full drinks or sorry, three full drinks or four, I don't remember. It's three or four, <laughs> three or four full drinks. Um, and you only have an hour, so you can take them with you when you leave, but they are, they, they change themes seasonally. So four times a year, you'll get different ones. I would recommend only doing it if you want the cocktails or mocktails, because most of the wine or beer you can get at other places in the park, but the cocktails and mocktails are themed to, um, I went during uh, the summer theme. And then I also went right when the Dark Castle o- or Dark Coaster opened. So they were all Dark Coaster themed. But that I recommend. I don't know if the show is going to change the sort of show type experience without giving too much away. What I will say is it did change slightly the two times I saw it. Um, and that might have just been based on who was available uh, staffing wise. But that's something that I always am very attuned to is like, did this thing change? Is it the same? I like to, you know, catch those changes. Uh, But that's something that if they continue to tweak it every year or so to continue to bring people back, it's a little expensive. I think it's about $50 per person, but you get three full drinks. So for, you know, drink prices, that's that's about right. If you're going to buy three cocktails in the park or something, but highly recommend that. It was a great experience. You also get uh, free popcorn while doing it. So that one's great. That sounds really fun. Yeah. It's really fun. I love when parks are kind of doing unique things with like entertainment mixed in with food and drink and everything else where it's not just like, um, here's our stand that sells drinks. Like it's something fun that you can do and it's like a unique thing. That's really cool. It's a small, intimate experience. You can do it in a group. Um, you can do it by yourself, but, uh, there will be several of you there. So it's like three or four different parties of people. So probably 20 or fewer people, depending on how many people sign up during your session. And it is, uh, something that is is great for the people who really are happy to get into it. Go with the corny jokes, you know, do the, do the, the shouting back, all of that. Um, you know, open up, practice a little improv. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
it reminds me of a small scale. They used to have at Disney World, they had the Adventures Club, which had like improv and drinks, and it was a nighttime thing. It closed in 2008, but it was there and it was so fun. But now, I don't know, it was again doing something like that. That was pre internet explosion, social media, all that. But it was, it was very fun. This sounds similar. I, I like it. I like the, well, I mean, as long as they're not constantly putting me on the spot, I like the, the kind of um, interactions when it's that small scale. Yeah. All right. Well, before we finish, this was not some deep thinking to put together this game here, but I know, you know, it's fun to play silly theme park games, especially you're familiar with this through your Rob as a podcast experience and everything else. So are you ready for another exciting theme park game here, Mary? I'm ready. Okay. This is similar to last time we did real or fake, but it was <laughs> marketing concepts like our Bush Sea World Bush Gardens. This is actually ride concepts like the theme of a ride and i'm going to re I'll read you a theme of a ride and you're going to say is this a real ride and then i will tell you where it is or whatever you may have heard of some of these i don't know there could be from around the world or is it fake that i just made it up okay so it's pretty simple none of these are at a sea world or bush gardens park to be clear they're at kind of random parks around the world just so you don't try to think like Okay, is that no? It's not a Bush Gardens Williamsburg. We're moving, we're moving away from that. It's not one. It's not none of the Sea World or entertainment. Okay, here we go. Number one. So you're just going to say real or fake, and I just wrote this up. This is not an official marketing statement. If these are real, travel back in time and visit the Ice Age, ancient Greece, and more on a toilet seat. I mean, it sounds like a cool ride. Um... I have to go fake though. What is, I mean, if that, is that a real straddle coaster <laughs> on a toilet seat? Now that's a concept. So you're saying it's fake. I'm saying it's fake. It is real. Oh no. It is real. There is a ride called the time machine. It's different in French, but at Futurisco Park in France. Oh my gosh. There is a ride where the, the ride, it's like a dark ride, but there's screens in front of you. There's apparently these video game characters called the Raving Rabbids that are involved with this and apparently somehow they start a time machine and you are in the bathroom the seats are not like i've never ridden this this is what <laughs> i they're soft they're not like you're okay. sitting on like a hard toilet gotcha. but they are themed to look like a toilet and then you sit on that and ride and ride the ride oh my so gosh that is, as a real thing i <laughs> i stumbled upon this once on youtube and it was like yep that's a ride but apparently it's like screen based and so then you're seeing screens of like all these different places like the Ice Age and ancient Greece and stuff. Okay. So, this is what they should put in Bush Gardens. This is the <laughs> new dark ride. This is what should have been in there, I think. But so that was real. That was real. Okay. Second one. Experience what it's like. See, I'm going to laugh at every one of these, even if it's true or false. So don't look at me too much. But experience what it's like to be made into a sandwich in this subway sponsored dark ride through each step of the process to make a foot long. Oh, I want that one to be true too. I don't, does Subway have that kind of cachet for a theme park? But isn't there like a food themed theme park? Nah, I'm, I'm going to have to go fake on this one. Yeah, yeah, that's Subway okay. Fake. But <laughs> I, I do think though, um, I will say there are some weird rides like this, especially if you go to like Japan and stuff, which I have not been to, but what I've seen, you know, I mean, Subway, they they show up on TV shows and stuff as a sponsor, like Community. They mm -hmm. did that and all that. So maybe, maybe they should be investing in it. But yeah, I I don't know if I that might be a, a scary ride <laughs> to be to be. You know, I don't know. Like, what is your role? I don't want to think about it too much. Well, very good, Mary. That is very good. Okay, number three, ride a log flume with dark ride scenes, including going past people bathing inside a bathtub. Now I like this one. It's okay, but you already had the toilet seat one. Uh, <laughs> too much, too many bathroom rides. And I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go real on this one. This sounds fun. Yeah, it is real. It is at Tripstrill, which is a park in Germany, in Klebron, Germany. There's a ride where your log flume car, log flume vehicle, which really is not that different, really, but it's shaped like a bathtub. And there is one point where you go past people bathing. I saw again the ride video. Not one I think we would see in the United States. Okay. That's what I will say. They have weird rides in Germany. I don't know. But very good. Okay. So, number four. Board a rapids ride where you go through a noodles production factory and where you smash buttons to keep your noodles away from a kettle and to help avoid getting soaked. 
I th- I feel like there is a theme park that's all food themed. I'm going true for this one. There's got to be, <laughs> it's got to be a food. Yeah, one. that's true. Yeah. This is in Japan. I don't know if the whole park is, but in this park, Yumiru Land, okay, there is a Nissan food factory building, and one of the rides is a rapids ride where you essentially. They're producing noodles, and there's these giant noodles, and there's these animated guys with kettles that are trying to get you, and they show these people like hitting the button. Oh my gosh! <sighs> so much good YouTube content for you to look up. I, I need, so I need to look up all of this. <laughs> Last one: a dark ride themed to the TV show Quantum Leap, the original version, where you leap through time in various bodies and experience historic events like the JFK assassination and the Vietnam War. Oh my gosh. Who who's asking for that? Um fans of the TV show Quantum Leap starring <laughs> Scott Bakula and um Dean Stockwell. Sure. All right. Uh yeah, this one's real. <laughs> no. Okay. No, this, is okay. Real. <laughs> this is not real. I was like I actually wrote it and I was like that is no way that anyone that, Oh, nope. Uh, I was right. <laughs> I sold it to you. I, sometimes you know, it, it seems so ridiculous that maybe it's real. Yeah, I don't know. I thought that um I mean, really, are we going to experience the JFK assassination in a theme park ride? I don't know, but um, I, I still like the idea, though. I think, I mean, now there's a new Quantum Leap on Peacock, or I guess it's on NBC. I don't know. I have not watched it, but apparently there is a new show. But um, I don't know if it's as popular. But okay. Well, you did pretty good. Let me see here. Let me do the tally here. Not that you win or lose anything based on the tally. I think that was about 50 50. Yeah, so. Oh, no, you missed the toilet one. Yeah. <laughs> and you missed the last one. Okay, so you got three out of five. Good job. All right, you yes. know what? <laughs> That's um, okay. Nice work. But um, And I apologize to the listeners, but um, I will say the ones that are real, especially the the one on the toilet seat, I still can't believe is a real thing. I just, <laughs> it's in France. I don't know. But the the uh, noodle factory one is is something worth checking out. It's ridiculous. That's what I will say. Well, thank you for indulging me on that game. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that was that was fun. Um, I look, I, I'll, I'm always down for a competition, even if, um, even if it's as ridiculous as guess this real or fake theme park ride. I think I need to do more planning in the future because this is a little thrown together. Though those are real rides, but um, I don't know. I don't know if it's up with with my past results here. Well. Mary, this has been very fun. I am very excited about the Loch Ness Monster and the Speakeasy, the Dark Coaster, maybe. Okay, okay. So, but if listeners want to check out, I know you do a lot of other podcasts, um, several different types. Where can they follow you online or where can they listen to other things? Uh, You can follow me at Frail Mary on every platform. And um, Instagram is mostly where I talk about running. So I don't know if you're going to be interested in that. And then uh, if you're, if you want to hear me on more podcasts, uh, follow me on Twitter and you can find all the links to my big brother, survivor, Riverdale, twilight coverage um, over there. Well, excellent. Well, Mary, thank you again for, um, giving us all the info and history on Bush Garden Williamsburg. This was really fun. Yeah, I had a great time as always. Thanks for having me on, Dan. Well, that was a lot of fun. The time when I finally get back to Bush Gardens Williamsburg, I will know so much more about these coasters and everything else that was there. Thanks to talking with Mary on several of these podcasts. If you want to check out the past episodes that Mary was on and a lot more, including interviews with former Disney Imagineers, go to tomorrowsociety.com slash podcast with an S at the end. Or you can just check out Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can go all the way back to the beginning, where it was a little rough, but still super fun from the start. I would like to give a big thanks to I am Maddie 11 who left a review that said, this is one of the best theme park podcasts out there. Also described it as mature and detailed. Mature, huh? Maddie, you're treading on thin ground there, but thank you so much for that. And I always appreciate Apple podcast reviews, Spotify ratings, wherever you can help spread the word, just share it on social media. It makes a huge difference and helps to continue to grow 
this really fun project for me. Also want to give a shout out to Neil Hunter Hyde, who is one of the new Tomorrow Society members on Patreon. Neil had some fun on Twitter responding to some of our ideas on the updating Spaceship Earth podcast, which is always cool to see. If you'd like to learn more about helping to support the show through Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash Tomorrow Society. Check out some cool perks you can get by helping out this show which is basically just me the tomorrow society sounds like a grand organization but it's mostly just me doing this <laughs> so i appreciate any help you can give for sure the music for this episode was written by adam hooky and performed by the sophisticated babies thank you so much as always for listening to this show i really appreciate it hope you're all doing awesome out there and had a great Halloween out here in the cold. We were out there here in St. Louis. Hopefully you had good weather and a lot of fun as you and others partied, went trick-or-treating, wore costumes to work, whatever you do on Halloween. Hope you had a blast. Take care, and I will talk to you again very soon. <laughs>